Today, budget, smudge it, fudge it. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, of course, last night we had uh, the budget pretty much all pre-leaked and pretty much in line with expectations. And if you look around, there's been a lot of commentary about it. I actually found the commentary in the conversation some of the best. So I'm going to pick some of the best comments from there. But also weave it into a broader conversation about this. And this is that the assumptions behind the budget are firstly that the borders won't really start to open until the middle of next year. That they may be able to bring some foreign students back towards the end of this year, presumably through quarantine. And that the real story here is that this is a health crisis which is continuing and therefore getting the vaccines rolled out is critical and that everything the government is doing is predicated on Fortress Australia. So we're going to spend at home, travel at home and frankly be somewhat disconnected from the rest of the world. Interesting positioning. The other point to make here is that migration is also going to be very limited. So population growth will be a whole lot slower than it's traditionally been. And that, of course, has significant impacts on things like demand for housing, as well as broader employment. Now, in the conversation, they wrote, never before has a budget spent so much to supercharge the economy after the worst of a recession has already passed. Well, I think that's a big assumption. The data may point that way, but I'm not sure that's the full picture. And the overall budget said that a strong economy would enable the government to stabilise debt as a share of the economy over time. Net debt is expected to peak at 40.9% of GDP around June 2025. That's a lower peak than forecast in the earlier budget and then fall back to 37% of GDP by the end of the medium term. Well, nice if we can do it, but it's worth just reflecting on the fact that we will have thrown well over $1 trillion into the economy so far. And the question that we should be asking is, did that money get thrown in the right areas? And is the forward investment also in the right areas? The economy certainly bounced back from last year's COVID recession and bounced back far more sharply than the Treasury or just about anyone else, including myself, expected. And the benefit from the higher than expected tax collections that flowed from more people than expected in work, a much higher than expected iron ore price, and lower than expected unemployment benefits flow to, well, around $26 billion this year, $15 billion next year, and $18 billion the year after. But rather than bank those riches and improve the budget bottom line, as the coalition's budget strategy used to require it to do, the government has instead decided to spend a lot. It will spend $21 billion of this year's money. It will spend up to new tax concessions around $26.9 billion, which was far more than next year's $15.5 billion bounty and so on. Frydenberg has come good on his historic promise to keep spending way beyond the crisis to drive the unemployment rate down below where it was when the pandemic started. The budget now predicts an unemployment rate of 4.75% by mid-2023 and 4.5% by mid-2024. Pause there. Of course, the RBA is saying we need an even lower rate than that. And their predictions for unemployment so far have been pretty miserable. So it'll be interesting to see whether it's different this time. If delivered, and the strategy published in the budget requires him to keep spending until it is, 
it will mark what the budget papers describe as the first sustained period of unemployment below 5% since before the global financial crisis and only the second time since the early 1970s. Now, of course, one thing to bear in mind here is definition of unemployment. You only need to work for an hour a week and you're employed. So really, they should be talking about underemployment rather than unemployment, but nobody wants to go there. There's more than 2 million Australians underemployed or unemployed, and I'm not sure that that is going to be reduced that much. In the same way as Australia emerged before the early 1990s recession with a dramatically lower inflation rate, because the Reserve Bank was determined to salvage something from the carnage, Frydenberg has decided to exit the COVID recession with an ongoing lower floor under unemployment. In fact, both the Treasury and the Reserve Bank believe Australia can sustain much lower unemployment than the 5 to 6 per cent that it has grown used to. The Treasury's estimate is 4.5 per cent. The Reserve Bank's is nearer 4 per cent. And it's worth remembering that before COVID, the United States managed down to 3.5 per cent, but again, on fudged figures. If achieved, it will mean hundreds of thousands more Australians providing services, drawing paychecks and paying tax, and they'll be no longer on benefits. A dramatic budget graph tracking the fortunes of every Australian whose payroll was reported to the tax office throughout 2020 shows that the biggest victims of the COVID recession by far were those without post-school education. At the deepest point of the COVID recession in May, they were almost three times as likely to have lost their jobs as Australians with degrees. The budget provides an extra $400 million for low fee or no cost training for job seekers to be matched by the states, an extra $481 million for the transition to work employment services directed at Australians aged 24 and under, and a further $2.4 billion to the Boosting Apprenticeship Commencements Program. But most of what it intends to do for jobs is the indirect result of a barely precedented expansion in spending and tax concessions in all sorts of areas. The extra $17.7 .7 billion it is spending on aged care over four years ought to create many jobs as should the extra $13.2 billion it is spending on the National Disability Insurance Scheme. The point there, of course, is though that the jobs that are being created might be relatively low paid and relatively unskilled jobs. And they might be part time, so it would take people off the unemployment list, but not necessarily on the fully employed list and not necessarily on the well paid list. The $1.7 billion it's spending on making childcare more affordable should both create jobs in the sector and free up more parents to return to work, which sort of begs the question, well, do people want to go and work more? Because, of course, there is now ever more pressure on both parents to go out to work. An extra $20 billion in business tax concessions should help as well. The budget's break with the past isn't its dramatic expansion of discretionary spending. That's common in recessions. What's unusual is that spending is being ramped up when we are actually not in a recession. In the words beloved of economists, the spending is pro-cyclical rather than counter-cyclical. It's designed to supercharge our exit from recession rather than merely bringing it about. Or perhaps we should say it's trying to ensure that the artificially induced momentum that's been created by massive government spending is continued at least beyond the next election, which is probably closer to the truth. And in fact, there's little signs of the spending stopping. Is this government or the next achieve success in driving the unemployment rate down to 4.5%? It will want to go further. It will keep going further right up until we get inflation near the top of the Reserve Bank's 2 to 3% target band and wages growth in excess of 3%, neither of which 
This budget foresees in forecast going out for the next four years. Government debt, an anathema to the coalition when Labour ran it up during the and after the global financial crisis, isn't evidently now much of a constraint. In fact, you could argue that they're following the MMT path, at least in terms of budget spending, but not necessarily in intent. The Reserve Bank holds much of the government's debt, it didn't during Labour's time of course, and is buying as much of it as it needs to keep interest rates low. Recently interest rates have been rising, but not for most of the government's borrowings, which are long term. The budget papers show that even with net government debt at 34% of GDP and heading to 44% interest payments on that debt are much less of a drain on the budget than they were back in the mid-1990s when net debt hit just 18% of GDP. But of course the question is will rates stay that low for that long? Some would say yes, some would say no. And the times have changed worldwide. Few nations have an aversion to government debt, especially not the US. In Australia, the only side of politics that used to complain about debt is currently in office and spending like there's an election ahead. Before COVID, the fiscal strategy spelled out in the budget as part of the Charter of Budget Honesty required the government to eliminate net debt. Frydenberg's revised strategy merely requires him to stabilise and then reduce net debt as a share of the economy. His priority is driving down unemployment. If that helps expand the economy and so drives down net debt as a share of the economy, so much the better, but he wants to do it regardless. And it's worth just recalling that both the Treasurer and the Reserve Bank are now saying that things like higher house prices and low interest rates are a side effect required to drive employment up and unemployment down, as if those things are somehow mutually exclusive. They are not. There are policy choices that could be taken. Now, it's just worth going through in slightly more detail some of the things that are in the budget. So there are the big ones. $1.7 billion over the next four years for childcare, increasing the childcare subsidy by up to 95% for the second and any further children aged five years and under, and removing the annual cap of $10,560 from this financial year. $7.2 billion to extend low and middle income tax offsets throughout this tax year, which is up to $1,080 for individuals and $2,160 for dual income couples. Of course, that was going to be removed. So this isn't new money, it's just continuing the existing arrangement. $2 billion over the next four years for mental health and suicide prevention services, and $17.7 .7 billion over the next five years for aged care including $6.5 billion for 80,000 additional home care packages and $7.8 billion of services for residential care. And then there's $15.2 billion over the next 10 years for infrastructure, including $3.3 billion for New South Wales, $3 billion for Victoria, and $3.2 billion for South Australia. By the way, most of that was already pre-announced. So I'm not sure how much of it is really new, and how much is a re-announcement of an announcement of an announcement? And then there's $998.1 million over the next four years for initiatives to reduce and support victims of family violence. And $464.7 million over the next two years in increased funding for offshore immigration detention and expansion of the Christmas Island Detention Centre. And $671.1 million in savings over the next five years in applying a four-year waiting period for new residents for welfare payments from January the 1st, 2022. And there's also a $400 million reduction in funding to universities over the past financial year, and $107 million in savings over the next four years in reductions to the MBS subsidy of MRIs and multiple code claims. And then there's a $1.1 billion in savings by replacing JobActive with a self-service digital portal for job seekers. Now, 
When you actually stand back and think about it, this is really all relatively small beer. And the question I ask is, where is all that spending really going and where is it really hitting the real economy? And the answer is there's nothing strategic here at all. This is about tactical support to try and keep the current bubble going. I passed the election at least. And then, as the Grattan Institute said last year's post-budget photo ops were all heavy machinery and hard hats. But this year we are seeing soft focus shots with children and the elderly. The big story of the budget is not just that the government is spending tens of billions more as we emerge from the recession, it's also the major shift in what the money is being spent on. The change in fiscal strategy from a construction-led recovery last year to a concerted emphasis on women and the care sector this year is based on solid economic advice, they say. It's also come at the best possible time for a government that has been in the spotlight for underfunding aged care and mental health and under pressure to do more to support women's economic participation. The Treasurer was understandably eager to emphasise the government's new spending initiatives and the shift is in fact notable. But while there is indeed welcome progress here, the budget they say falls short of delivering big structural reforms that are needed for childcare, aged care and mental health. For childcare, the government has announced an extra $1.7 billion over three years, starting from July 2022, and a modest boost to the $9 billion the government spent last financial year. Grattan proposed a more ambitious package which would have spurred big economic gains from higher female workforce participation. The budget falls short of that, but it is still well targeted at the families that face the most crippling out-of-pocket childcare costs, those with two or more children under six in care. For aged care, there is that extra $17.7 billion over four years. That's a significant increase to the $22.5 billion the government spent last financial year. While not enough to deliver the Aged Care Royal Commission's vision of a full rights-based model where every Australian is entitled to the care they need, it does still offer improvements. The 80,000 new home care packages will help to reduce waiting times and the boost to frontline care minutes and the basic daily fee provides additional support to those in residential care. The accompanying focus on attracting training and upskilling staff is particularly welcome given that the Royal Commission anticipates future staff shortages, although the budget doesn't have much specific to say about pay in the sector. For mental health, a sector whose problems have been laid bare by increased demand for services during the pandemic, there is an extra $2.3 billion over four years. And funding is targeted towards expanding access to mental health services and bolstering suicide prevention, but it falls short of the system reform required. The budget flags $3.4 billion over four years for women's measures, including childcare. Outside of childcare, the biggest are for women's health at $365 million and spending on women's safety, including violence prevention, up $1.1 billion. These measures, particularly the increased spend on frontline and responsive services to family violence, are important and significant. But the more significant shift for women comes in the recognition that job creating budgets need to invest in a broader range of jobs, including in service sectors. About 80% of Australians work in services and 90% of working women do that. So investing in those jobs secures a broader recovery than the previous hard hat focus. While last year's budget ran hard on infrastructure and investment tax breaks that favour capital intensive sectors, this time around there is a strong focus on care economy jobs through the spend on aged care, childcare and mental health. And even the extended job trainer scheme receives a care centred makeover with an additional 33,800 low fee and free training places set aside to support future aged care workers. Service sectors hit hard by COVID also received some cash, including the already announced $1.2 billion support package for the aviation and tourism sector and the $300 million 
for the creative and cultural sector. Universities again miss out, but private education providers do receive additional supports. Other major measures in the budget include the rollover of the low and middle tax offset, the so-called lamington, for another year, delivering up to $1,080 into the hands of low and middle income taxpayers next year, and the extension of two key business tax measures, instant expensing and loss carrybacks, focused on bringing forward business investment. The challenge is that much of this increased spending is permanent. And when combined with the impact of COVID on migration and on the size of the economy, this leaves the medium term forecast looking, well, markedly different to the probably unrealistic ones that voters were served up before the 2019 election. But as the Parliamentary Budget Office suggested a fortnight ago, even with this shift, Australia's debt levels are sustainable. And are likely to remain so. Net debt is forecast to stabilise and then fall over the medium term even with continuing deficits. This doesn't mean that long-term structural challenges disappear, but it does mean that there is more breathing space for the government to let voters see its softer side as an economic as well as political strategy. That makes a lot of sense, but I have to say a lot of it is just positioning for that election, which is going to happen within the next year. Now, Richard Holden wrote also in the conversation, I don't often feel sorry for politicians, but having to manage a process that produces forecasts about the next four years of an economy still clawing its way out of a pandemic, and then having to publicly defend those forecasts is no easy task. That said, the compassion for the plight of Treasurer Josh Frydenberg shouldn't stop us judging his budget forecasts. And like all forecasts, those rest heavily on the assumptions that underpin them. The core budget assumptions about unemployment and economic growth are relatively rosy. Unemployment is forecast to be down to 4.75% by 23 and 4.5% the year after, both well below pre-pandemic levels. Real GDP growth is expected to rebound to 4.25% in 21-22 and then settle down to about 2.5% thereafter. Given that we are unlikely to have the population growth of the pre-COVID era, that's a pretty high rate. Taking a look graphically at actual and forecast GDP makes it clear why folks are talking about a V-shaped recovery. But even the fairly bullish assumptions reveal a recovery where the V isn't really sharp enough. Let's call it a floppy V-shaped recovery. That's rather disappointing, especially given Frydenberg has fundamentally shifted Liberal Party fiscal strategy away from debt and deficits and dalliances with austerity to one that sees government spending at more than 26% of GDP in steady state. But what is more disappointing is that this increased spending isn't forecast to translate into stronger employment and wages growth. The budget forecasts an unemployment rate of 4.5% in 2023 24 and 24 25. That's better than pre pandemic levels, but not all that close to the 4% or lower number many economists, including RBA Governor Phil Lowe, thinks might be required to get wages growing meaningfully for the first time since 2013. The budget forecast reflects this with wages growth of just 2.25% in 2023 and 2.5% in 2023 24 both equal to forecast inflation in those years. That is, real wages growth is not even forecast to begin again until 24 25 and even then only barely. Non-mining business investment is forecast to grow at 1.5% in 2122 and then jump to a massive 12.5% in 2223 might be optimistic. That might reflect a post-COVID investment boom driven by a widely mRNA vaccinated nation and a raft of government incentives, or it might just be wishful thinking, he says. As to immigration, we can expect our borders to be largely shut for the foreseeable future. This is reflected in the budget's forecast population growth of around 0.1% in 2021, 0.2% in 21-22, and 0.8% in 2223. Whether immigration does actually pick up significantly in 2223 depends critically on our vaccine rollout. 
if we can reverse the bungled execution to date, overcome vaccine hesitancy, and secure enough Pfizer and Moderna doses, including the boosters, immigration might grow strongly then. But there are a number of things that have to be done right for that to happen, and the government, frankly, has a poor track record to date on these things. And then there's one notable assumption that makes news in every budget the iron ore price. The budget papers themselves highlight the importance of it, noting the recent strength in key commodity prices, particularly iron ore, have seen a significant resurgence in Australia's terms of trade. As a result, nominal GDP is expected to grow by 3 and 3 quarters percent in 2021, and by a further 3.5% in 2021 22 and by 2% 2 in 2022 23 The budget assumes the iron ore price will decline from its current level of over $200 US a tonne to $55 US a tonne by March 2022. That's an incredibly pessimistic assumption, basically, which gives the government a buffer on the headline deficit figure. If the forecast of a $99.3 billion deficit in 2022-23 is beaten significantly, it's likely to be due simply to iron ore prices staying high as they have done for the last year or two. The core economic assumptions discussed above underpin the budget's bottom line, a number that used to receive considerable more attention when there was a question of when the budget might be back in surplus. Those days, of course, are gone. Frydenberg has engineered a remarkable shift in Liberal Party economic philosophy. While maintaining their brands, the party of lower taxes, not higher taxes, they have actually jettisoned budget balance fetishism. But the biggest assumption of all in the out years of the budget is that the government, should it be re-elected, sticks to this new strategy. If they do, it holds the promise of being transformative. It would represent a modest but welcome transformation in the economy and a dramatic transformation of the Liberal Party brand. But you'd have to say there will be a number of people calling for tighter cuts sooner. And of course, it also does put a lot of pressure on the Labour Party because effectively the Liberals have pretty much delivered a Labour Party budget. And that is something we're going to have to watch ahead, because can the Labour Party out-Labour the Liberal Party, who are in turn mirroring what Labour would have done? That's a very interesting question for me. But I have to say the bottom line is this. All of that spending, all the $1 trillion that have been spent to date, have been done on short-term tactical fix-me-ups. I don't see the strategic vision that we need. I don't see the big initiatives to take us to a new future state. And to that end, the Labour Party, and I think also the Labour Party too, seem to me incapable of thinking beyond the three-year election cycle. But I do believe we need more significant strategic thinking and long-term vision about where we want to head as a nation. And if you want more on that, go check out my live show that I recorded just yesterday with Robbie Barr from the Citizens Party, where we talked about the vision thing and why just doing short-term tactical things isn't enough. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.